This episode is about addiction, depression, anxiety, and harm by the medical system. Please listen with care. If you feel like you need support, we've got resources listed in our show notes. I know for myself, boredom is one of my biggest triggers. If I allow myself to sit around and get bored enough to get trapped in my head and start struggling with the way I'm feeling and, and I have a way or means to, to pick up and use, I'm going to do it. This is In Our Heads, a TVO Today podcast about generation distress. I'm Tiffany Lam. My name is Jason, Jason Simpson. I'm a 29-year-old male originally from Bracebridge, Muskoka. Spent a fair amount of my time, certainly in my adult life, in northeastern Ontario, North Bay, Sudbury area. Come from a middle-class family. And for most of my life, I struggled at times with uh, mental health, and that kind of evolved into pretty serious addiction issues. Uh, And right now, I'm a little over two years clean and sober. And... uh, essentially starting my life over in many ways. Jason and I connected over a Zoom call after he got off work. He lives up at Manitoulin Island right now, about a six hour drive northwest from the TVO office in Midtown Toronto. He works at a body shop at the largest full service marina on the North Channel. He fixes boats, among other things. I'm six months into uh, an informal apprenticeship in uh, marine restoration and fiberglassing. I had to Google this. Fiberglass helps weigh down a boat so they're not as easily buffeted by the wind. Fiberglassed vessels tend to drift slower and more predictably. It hasn't always been like this for Jason. To my co-producer Matthew, Jason described growing up in his family as fairly dysfunctional, separated, and a lot of abuse and alcoholism. I started displaying symptoms or signs of depression and anxiety when I was fairly young, maybe 11, 12 years of age. And shortly after that, I began self-medicating. You know, I was introduced to to alcohol and uh, substances. And and that kind of became uh, my way and my means of coping for the following 13 years of my life. I, I was pretty much a daily user and or drinker. One day, it became clear to him that he really needed to make a change. I realized for some time, you know, I was dysfunctional when I was under the influence and I was dysfunctional when I was not under the influence. There were many times I couldn't hold down a job. You know, I couldn't achieve a a consistent kind of functionality in day-to-day life. And uh, and I, I just kept going farther and farther downhill and faster as time went on. I just remember waking up at about 7.30 in the morning on Wednesday, May 26th, 2021. And I looked out the window and I just thought to myself, you know, it's now or never and it's either this or nothing. You know, I, I couldn't I couldn't think of any other options. I, I was I was all out of answers. You know, not that I had any good answers to begin with. You know, I kept repeating the same mistakes, um, but I just remember thinking, you know, yeah, I'm going to go do this and uh, and I'm going to stick it out this time. Jason's mom is Indigenous, so Jason thought to reach out to an Indigenous elder for help. And I just reached out to her over the phone, just uh, hoping to get some guidance and direction. When Jason told her he wanted to try something different, something grounded in learning more about the land and nature, The Indigenous elders suggested that Jason should check out a treatment centre called Kwekwatsuin Mikin. Their website shortens it to Gwek, G-W-E-K dot C-A. This is a podcast, so I'm curious, when you sit in silence at Gwek, what do you think you remember hearing? The birds. The birds? Yeah. And often the wind, even when it didn't feel windy, you could still hear the wind. I mean, out out on the big water, you might not be able to feel it, 
where you are, but you can hear it on the top of the trees. And of course the waves, the sound of water, which is probably the most nurturing sound that I think I've ever heard. You know, just that constant flow of gentle waves brushing against the shore. Wakwaz and Meekin is uh, a mental health and addictions program on Manitoulin Island operating across the uh, Robinson Huron Treaty area that really focuses on a continuum of care from land based and wilderness treatment all the way through community aftercare. Gwekwatsu and Meekin separates their program into three phases land based treatment, live in aftercare, and community aftercare. We've heard the term continuum of care in the show before that notion of stepped care where mental health treatment is proportionate to the complexity of your needs. There's a space to choose which step you're ready for, and the steps should be navigated with ease. Gwek's land-based treatment appears to be on the further end of the spectrum. Specialized, continuous, chronic care. My name is Matt Maracle, and I'm currently the Director of Operations at Gwek Quad I'm a band member of Mohawks of the Bay of Pointe, but I also have matrilineal um, association with Chiging First Nation up here on Manitoulin Island, which is uh, what brought us up here. Matt's a dad to three girls who are eight, seven, and three years old. The name of the program is Gwek Quadzun, which means honesty. Um, so it's it's very honest conversation. The theme of honesty seems to run through the program in different ways. It seems to encourage honesty within individual participants of their land-based 90 days treatment. The honest acknowledgement of what brought them to this treatment program is encouraged right in the application form. Applicants must check off what their mental health struggles are in a long laundry list depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, self-harm, addiction, among others. They say whether they've been diagnosed formally. They tick off which drugs they use. They declare whether they've ever been part of a gang, ever been part of human trafficking, been in an abusive relationship recently, or ever had a restraining order placed against them. Again, just to name a few. If people declare a criminal background or anything like that, it doesn't disqualify them necessarily, right? No, absolutely not. Matt says that those declarations just help him and his staff get a better sense of how to keep the program as safe as possible. The only thing where we would have to sort of draw our line is we can't be named on a court order to attend treatment because we are a voluntary program. This single disqualification criteria strikes me as very meaningful, given that we've learned throughout our series that Black and Indigenous folks' entry into mental health care is disproportionately involuntary. An involuntary entry can be highly traumatic. No one can be ordered to attend Gwek Wadswin, um, because we do believe in that freedom of choice and that right to attend and participate and, and to seek um, their own sort of recovery and wellness journey. Gwek Wadswin Meekin's hope is to have applicants intentionally make the choice to make change. It's about removing oneself from a lot of the hardships, the barriers and the challenges of whatever community they may be coming from and really providing an opportunity for someone to have 90 days to truly focus on their self. It's about being able to really look at the root cause of what got us to where we are now and how do we create uh, meaningful change moving forward. Upon arrival, participants are effectively removed from everything they'd once known and are exposed to the land that they'll be living on for the next 90 days. We're absolutely um, blessed with, with the natural surrounding that we have. But as idyllic as these surroundings are, the program is no breeze. One of the absolute first things that we do after intake is we uh, get in canoes and we paddle across. It's about a four kilometer paddle um, from our launch point to our actual site. And the reason we do that is we want to build success right off the hop. I can see where Matt's coming from there. Overcoming something difficult can help build self-confidence. But a four kilometer paddle sounds like no joke. Notably, people 
also have to declare how physically active they've been in the application form. Not at all is an option. I asked if that would mean applicants aren't a good fit for their programming. <laughs> Not necessarily, um, because when we get into some of those ruts uh, when we're in active usage and addiction, um, what we see oftentimes is while they may not be active, they're is a willingness to try and participate and to be out there. A lot of the things that we hear are individuals come out and they go fishing, for example, and they're like, oh, I haven't done this since I was a kid. It feels so good to get back to this. The honest conversation at Gwikwatsu and Meekin admittedly goes both ways, though. Obviously, we hear things that people aren't thrilled about. Maybe it's, I don't know, the, the expedition or the canoe trek was too long. So we adjust. It's always been a uh, an evolving program. I strive to meet the needs of participants as they come in. The criteria for being admitted to GWEC's land-based treatment program is simple. They have to be at least 19 years old and be open to Anishinaabe values and traditions. Within the land-based treatment model, it's really about um, creating stabilization, emotional growth, resilience, and looking at uh, creating success out in the wilderness setting. There isn't a single therapy game plan, like attending cognitive behavioral therapy sessions on a set schedule. It's not one typical tool, but it's about finding those teachable moments in the everyday relationship and everyday operation that's happening. The website says the goal for this portion of their treatment is to help achieve stabilization, emotional growth, self-management skills, and social skills. It's four season programming, so we operate rain or shine. Our executive director famously says it's a it's an outdoors program, not a sunshine program. So within that setting, individuals, uh, depending on what season they're in, they really focus on different seasonal activities. But really, it's about creating that connection to land. Really having that dedicated 90 days is an opportunity to literally face the hazards of the natural environment and weather the storm and to come out with brighter eyes and a fuller body on the other side of things. I've learned that being connected with the land has deeply spiritual implications in Indigenous teachings. The chief we spoke to in episode one of the series from Hiawatha First Nation, Chief Lori Carr, she said the good life was called Manoba Matsuin in her language. That's Anishinaabe Moan. Our goal is what we say is to live um, in Manoba Matsuin, and that's the good life. You know, that is the life creator intended for all of us. And so we need to get there. My English name is Lori. My Indigenous name is Eagle Woman, and I am chief of our community of Hiawatha First Nation. For reference, Hiawatha First Nation is around Peterborough. Chief Carr told me that Manoba Matsuin can only be achieved in a holistic way. So not just treating the intellectual or the mental capacities. There's also the physical and the emotional and the spiritual, and they all have to be in balance. And so you can't look at just the one aspect or the one piece of it. You have to look at all of it. Back when she was just Lori and not yet chief, she helped with community mental health initiatives for Hiawatha shortly after she got her own formal anxiety diagnosis. She saw how generations before her didn't talk about depression and anxiety. It stays unresolved, and how, how horrible is that to feel that internally and not know what it is and not know that you can do something about it or taking care of yourself is okay. These are the messages that have, you know, come out more and more, and it, only you can take care of yourself, and we're here to support you. This person-centered approach is one that Matt and his team at Gwekwatsu and Meekin champion. According to their website, the program's goal is to remove barriers to treatment for Indigenous youth and young adults in northeastern Ontario. But anyone with an OHIP card is eligible and welcome to apply since the program is in part publicly funded. Matt and the team believe that fostering participants' connection with the land lends itself to a holistic approach to achieving good mental health. It's interesting, too, because we we asked that question um, with the interview for new staff is, uh, you know, can you please describe a holistic model of care for participants? And it's amazing because you never really get the same answer twice, but kind of the foundation of it is really looking at the person first. And really, that comes down to a basic teaching of the medicine wheel. 
A medicine wheel is an indigenous symbol and guide to healing. Online, I see many iterations of these wheels from different indigenous cultures. One constant appears to be the way it represents healing and medicine as the process of balancing physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual well being in the context of the land that holds us. Four equal quadrants that make up a circle, being the visual representation. It's about trying to regain that balance. It's about trying to have that humility and that teaching and the understanding of where we fit in all of creation by having that connection with land. And then we're building the pieces around it too. So it starts with the holistic wraparound approach for the individual. The wraparound approach to services is a concept within actually often youth mental health care that acknowledges that youth having a tough time can require different types of help from different services. The approach looks to help coordinate peer and family support, as well as various workers or community representatives from different organizations. It's kind of like the hub model that we talked about in episode three. But here's how GWEC's land-based treatment is a bit different. We have uh, individuals that are with our counselors for 90 days, 24 hours. But when you're out on the land, because you're waking up and you're doing morning circle together and you're uh, in the kitchen tent or the cabin together and you're cooking and then you're going on treks and doing closing circles and running our group model and doing those one-on-ones, you're really looking at up to 118 hours of FaceTime with our land-based counselors over a one-week period. So within that first eight days on the land, the first eight days of their program, they've essentially doubled, they've expedited that therapeutic allyship because there's that much time together. Matt has seen how this added FaceTime helps to build rapport between participants and counselors. He says that GWEC is often the first time that participants in the program have built a trusted relationship with someone who works in mental health care. One of the things that I think is often overlooked is that importance of role modeling. So if we get out there on the land and something doesn't work and we throw our hands up in the air and say, oh, this sucks and we can't do this or what are we going to do now? We're not really demonstrating anything and we're sort of fueling a fire that is already there in terms of negativity and deficit based thinking. But if we look at something and say, hey, you know what, this isn't what we planned, but now we have to figure out how we're going to resolve this and how we're going to create resilience and how we're going to create success out of the situation. Then after 90 days, that becomes the mentality of the camp. And that mentality seems to help create bonds between the counselors and participants of each cohort. Here's Jason on what it was like when he first got to Gwekwatsu and Meekin. I can remember the first week of treatment out on the land with all of these complete strangers. None of us really wanted to get to know each other. And uh, before halfway through, we were like the most tightly knitted little fabric of family that I've, I think I've ever known. You know, I, I have a family of my own. You know, I've had multiple friend circles, but being isolated out in nature, completely detached from the outer world, right? It was different. It was almost like, it was the closest thing I, I think I ever felt to being part of a tribe. If we weren't out cutting deadfall trees and splitting firewood, we were out fishing in order to harvest or cultivate as much fresh fish as possible to, to add with our regular meals. Or uh, in some cases, we were out picking and then coming back to camp and preparing medicines, um, usually going on pretty lengthy canoe excursions, trips that would last up to maybe three or four days in our case. Throughout the day-to-day -day at the program, Jason learned more about the things he was good at. I found myself cooking quite a bit. I mean, I, I grew up cooking in, in restaurants and uh, I guess people tended to like what I made. Oh, that's nice. I would often sub in for someone if they didn't feel like they were up to uh, cooking for the day. The program also seemed to empower participants by introducing them to new things. Jason remembers doing something he had never done before. Our group constructed a, a 12 paddler Voyager canoe. It looks like a really long and fairly wide canoe, almost like a small Viking ship, but without the sail. It was a cedar strip canoe that we ended up fiberglassing. I believe we donated it to, to one of the local indigenous health centers. That was prior to, um, or actually during, I think the, uh, you know, the climax of the Every Child Matters movement. 
so we ended up painting most of it orange and, and donating it to this organization. And uh, to, to my knowledge, they were going to use it for kids in the community on that reservation to go on summer trips with out on the water. I felt happy when I was making it. And at the time to know that, you know, there was a, I guess, a fairly significant purpose of it all. You know, that definitely felt good. Despite his success getting sober, all the outdoor programming, and the skills he picked up at Gwek, Jason also wanted to be honest about something. I had a lot of time to sit and do nothing. And I, I didn't want to say that because maybe that would be kind of discouraging, but in truth, that's I, I know now that that is a big component of their program. Being out in nature constantly, it had this effect of, of just insulating me from all of the difficulties. It allowed me to really focus on some things that were going on within me that I had neglected for a long time. I learned that, you know, if I'm compassionate with myself and I'm patient and I'm tolerant, I can endure, I can sustain. I also learned how to make myself busy. In my case, uh, boredom is often a choice. You know, if we're going to talk about the, just the trigger of boredom, um, you know, boredom for me is very much a decision. Um, you know, there are so many things to do, even when out in the bush, whether you're with, with others or completely alone. I learned how to kind of rely on my inner child to find ways to be playful. That said, the land could be a cause for quitting the program, too. Here's Matt Miracle again, Gwikwatsu and Meekin's Director of Operations. We've had individuals who have left the program and said, you know, just the fall programming isn't for me. The uh, bugs are too bad or I don't want to you know, be on the trap line or whatever it is. And then they'll reapply for winter or summer and things like that as well. So um, it's just, again, recognizing the individuals where they're at, what best fits their needs. Um, because it's really reciprocal in that it's not just are they a good fit for the program, but is it, the program a good fit for them? I asked what the dropout rates were like. Fidelity to the program is a metric of success for mental health treatment for the government of Ontario. At the sort of height of our success, we've seen up to an 87% graduation rate with the 90-day program. And then we've sort of ebbed and flows between the national average, which is tough to get an actual number for whatever reason, but we've sort of ascertained it's between 35 and 50 percent. And, you know, we've gone anywhere between 50 and 75 on average to, to highs of 87 plus um, with those uh, graduation rates. But Matt was cautious about defining success by people sticking with the program. He framed success as relative. Like what is success? And to us, it isn't a graduation rate. Individuals who come, they may make it to 31 days, but they've only done 28 day programs in their past. The, your typical program looking at 28 days, even if someone just did 66% of our program, that's still 60 days and more than double what they would attend elsewhere. Outcomes from the therapy is another metric the government has used. Of course, relative outcomes would be trickier to quantify, but the expected outcomes listed on GWEC's website are linked to the medicine wheel, such as increase in physical health, decreased problematic substance use, increased perception of quality of life, increased life skills, including employment readiness, and increased knowledge and experience with Indigenous culture, resulting in stronger identity and resilience. But for what it's worth, Matt was keen to point out that employment readiness and educational engagement was something that Kwikwatsu and Meekin was able to help facilitate with success in the second phase of Gwek's continuum of care, the live-in aftercare, or LIAC. Once people graduate from land-based treatment, they're eligible to apply for one of the 11 LIAC beds to transition back to mainstream society. So we have 11 beds that are in a live-in facility where individuals are able to focus then on stable living environment, life skills development. Uh, there is an expectation that anyone within the program is working towards uh, higher education or uh, vocational success or anything like that. 
at this point, we're, we're really proud uh, to say that we have a 100% success rate of connecting our participants with an educational uh, institution or with uh, employment. So that's been, been really beneficial. When the Investigative Journalism Bureau first did their reporting on mental health care back in 2020, experts like Angela Mashford Pringle told the IJB that bringing youth back to the land where they can reconnect with their culture and language holds the greatest promise for healing. But Kwikwatsu and Meekin's existence is more an exception than a rule when it comes to mental health care. One expert said that it is often impossible to find help that incorporates a traditional First Nations approach. Here's Matt Maracle on the demand Gwek faces up in Manitoulin Island. Our waitlist just for our program alone for our 20 beds is anywhere between 140 and 180 people for any cohort. Um, and those are the ones that are eligible for the program. Then you have those who are then looking for programs for under 19. So. Um, there certainly is a lack of culturally appropriate services to meet the actual needs of the population. Gwek is currently working on getting their 13 to 19-year-old youth mental health and addictions program up and running. The demand isn't showing signs of slowing down when we look at recent numbers from our Western mainstream medical institutions. In Ontario, between 2019 and 2021, there's a small increase in the number of hospitalizations for youth and children for substance-related disorders. That's according to numbers from the Canadian Institute of Health Information. And while there was a small decrease in emergency visits and hospital stays for children and youth with mental disorders generally in 2020, the proportion for visits to the emergency room and hospitalizations for mental disorders increased. And it's worth noting that every year since 2019, Manitoulin Island's Public Health Unit, Sudbury and Districts, reported the highest rates of opioid-related emergency department visits. If you're familiar with Manitoulin, there is uh, basically a, a greater rate per capita of substance use. Uh, we just had a coroner's report that went through some of the numbers that we're seeing um, of deaths over the last four years. And when you actually weigh it um, by a per capita basis, the numbers are absolutely uh, remarkable and, and a little daunting and, and overwhelming when you kind of see what's happening on, on our island because it is a small location. Geography is not the only thing that can influence health outcomes. The data that the Investigative Journalism Bureau gathered between March and October of 2019 to 2020 found that 20% of 161 First Nations post-secondary students struggled with PTSD and substance abuse. Less than 10% of all ethnicities surveyed in Canada said the same. And while 30% of the Indigenous post-secondary students said that counseling they received was helpful, they were overall more likely to report feeling unsupported in their counseling, compared to other ethnicities. You may remember Jacqueline Carr. Jacqueline is Chief Carr's child. We heard from Chief Carr earlier in the episode on the importance of how to achieve the good life. We spoke with Jacqueline in episode one as well. They have faced a fair share of mental health struggles, but they're now a knowledge keeper in their community. And I was so grateful to be recognized for my community. Jacqueline approaches care in the Western system with caution. She felt she couldn't be completely honest with people in the medical system. I never really say a lot in therapy or counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists who are not Indigenous or do not have an in-depth understanding of our culture. I do not want to open up as much as I probably should because I feel like if I get a misdiagnosis on something that I'm going to be like mistreated in a way that my mind and my body may not be able to come back from. I just kind of get that feeling like I'm going back to being zombified again, like losing that kind of that thing that makes you you, that, that fire inside you or that, that zest, <laughs> that spice you got. Jacqueline's been off their psychiatric medication since 2022. She tells me that she has tried different kinds of psychiatric meds since 2011. When we met at Hiawatha First Nation, Jacqueline was coming off a medication. 
I was on a mood stabilizer. I felt like I was just kind of zombified, really. Though it did take away my extremes. Um, I just kind of felt just kind of going through the motions. And it didn't feel like it was for you then at that point? No. Yeah. And then I started having, I thought I was having thyroid issues because I was, uh, like, I, I was gaining weight like crazy. And then I have, like, I would come to work and I'd be just drenched in sweat. And while CAMH has said that antidepressants can be useful for up to 70% of those who try them, I think it's interesting that Jacqueline names this concern with the medical system, being diagnosed with something that she does not think is representative of her experience. In fact, there's a growing movement of people who are voicing their skepticism on the utility of medical diagnoses and are speaking out about the harm they've experienced in the medical system when it comes to mental health treatment. I think that kind of the MAD movement or the psychiatric survivor movement is still a movement that is often very overlooked. My name is Jenna Reed. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a woman who wears many hats. So I'm an artist and artistic director. Uh, I am an activist and I am a fairly reluctant academic. Jenna is also a white queer person. She tells me she's experienced sexual abuse growing up. And when she got to university, she was not doing so well. I think I've written about it publicly by saying I went batshit crazy. I was always being threatened to be institutionalized. It was always um, prioritizing making sure that I was on medications, regardless of what those medications were doing to my body. And it was doing pretty horrific things. So I was in a constant state of crisis, it felt like. When she was seeking support, it felt like she was being told that something was wrong with her instead. There was such a heavy focus on fixing me, and I don't actually think that that was a helpful approach. I don't believe that what I needed was to be fixed in the way that they saw it. And so this heavy emphasis on like, it just needs to be the right meds. It just needs to be the right diagnosis. And I have to say, it's like people will often be very curious to know what my diagnosis is. And I generally refuse to share specifically because for me, that was never an illuminating or helpful resource in coming to a diagnosis. I actually got dozens and dozens and dozens of diagnoses in my charts. Of course, there are people in this movement who also acknowledge that diagnoses can help people better understand who they are and better manage their mental health. But madness is also deeply connected to structural and systemic issues. And there's a lot within that that people don't have a knowledge of. So when you start to learn about the relationships, for instance, between the history of psychiatry and the enforcement historically and ongoing of colonial violence, well, then very Easily, I think, when you learn that history, you can see that unpacking madness as a justice issue then has us thinking, how are we addressing contemporary issues of colonial violence and how do those relate and overlap in movement spaces? The unfortunate part is that we don't even need to go that far in history to see how the medical system has harmed Indigenous people here. One story that rings loudest for me is Joyce Echequan's death in 2020 in Quebec. Even though her death was ruled accidental, the coroner's investigation in 2021 declared that racism and prejudice played a role in the outcome. Joyce had caught racist insults from medical staff on camera, but the coroner also found that the medical staff's course of treatment assumed that Joyce was in withdrawal. The assumption she was addicted to drugs was unfounded. 
When she became agitated at the hospital, she was given sedatives without further tests. And the fact that she was restrained and left lying down also may have led to her lungs filling up with excess liquid, leading to her death. As recently as 2022, health officials, this time in Manitoba, acknowledged there was anti-Indigenous racism in Northern Manitoba in their healthcare. And this was reflected in their healthcare outcomes. A declaration was signed to promise its elimination. Despite the risk for misunderstanding, and frankly, a history of harm, the director of operation of Gwekwatsu Mikin, Matt Miracle, also wants to be honest about something else too. Our strength is in the cultural approach, but we also understand we need to have those partnerships with some of those Western programs as well, especially when you're starting to look at things like the introduction of uh, methadone and suboxone within the program as well. Methadone and Suboxone is a type of opioid agonist therapy, medicine that offers a slower extended release of opioids to help with withdrawal management and curb problematic substance use. That's not necessarily a cultural approach, but it's a reality that if we were not to permit individuals with, uh, who are utilizing some of those opioid agonist therapies, uh, you know, we would lose a lot of people because we would be shutting down something that's very much embedded in their day to day. For Matt, it's not about doing away completely with Western approaches or being anti-medication. Sometimes you need things like that Western medicine in order to help support individuals through whatever it is that they're going through, um, whether it's uh, anxiety meds or uh, something that will help with depression or you know whatever it is, there is a benefit to appropriate medication regimen. In an email, Matt said that initially, Gwek did not allow opioid agonist therapy in their program for a number of reasons. But through a pilot project, they were able to take a look at how they could implement the use of OATs at Gwek. They developed appropriate policies and procedures, trained their staff and land-based counselors to support the administration of OAT, and occasionally would have a registered nurse once a month to help with its administration. Sometimes health teams will go to Gwek. And other times, GWEC participants and staff will access provincial facilities. Matt said it really depends on circumstance because of their person-centered approach. Being on Manitoulin, you know, we're certainly a, a much smaller population. Even things like withdrawal management and detox, our closest ones are 90 minutes to 120 minutes away. So a lot of things can happen from the point of leaving Manitoulin to being dropped off in, let's say, Sudbury, um, and then hoping that everything's going to be okay uh, after the, the detox period. So the service gaps are, are very obvious in what we do, and we're really working to fill those service gaps. And a lot of that is just bridging with our community partners and trying to support each other as we have new endeavors that work towards uh, filling some of those service gaps. GWEC does their best to have their individuals' programs ready through pre-treatment check-ins and referrals, knowing that many variables within the nature of addictions and recovery can come up. Their healthcare partners are aware of GWEC's intake days and are either on site or on standby. The ultimate goal is to have a therapeutic community that is able to support itself. Um, but again, just where we are and just with the HR supply and demand of being in a remote area, uh, you know, there, there can certainly be limitations to that just because of our population. It really does take takes a community. Um, and that's something that we've, we've wholeheartedly embraced and, and actively worked towards. To reach that ultimate goal, Matt says withdrawal management, one of the main moments for a blended approach, is one of the challenges they'll need to keep a good handle on. And again, there's only so much that, that we can do. It really needs to look at a sort of systems overhaul and how do we do things differently. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a novel approach, so to speak, because we're not doing anything that the blueprint hasn't already been laid for us. Um, we're just getting back to some of those sort of original teachings and the original understanding of nurturing spirit and the original understanding of bringing people together to heal together. Today, while Jason has a better handle on his addiction, he is still learning how to live with what could have been the root causes of it. 
I've struggled more with mental health and I guess lack of emotional health in the last two years than I ever have, um, even prior to my, my addictions. How so? Not knowing how to regulate my emotions. You know, how to cope with certain thinking patterns, particularly being a person with OCD. I can become pretty obsessive in the mind. And uh, the last time I met with a psychiatrist, he told me that people with OCD tend to generate slightly, if not much more intensively stronger emotions than the average person, just because we have a tendency to ruminate and obsess so deeply, right? I've had a uh, a lot of days and moments where I was really confused and I, I couldn't understand why my mind was thinking in ways it was and I, I struggled and tried desperately to control my thoughts and you know avoid negative thinking patterns that would really get me into a whole load of trouble physically. I remember for the first six months of my recovery I think I made at least seven or eight visits to the local emergency department at the nearest hospital you know because i was just so um intolerant i guess of the way i was feeling and the things i was thinking um you know the first time i i ever experienced a, a panic attack was has been in my recovery you know the first time i've experienced uh suicidal ideation has been in my recovery as many good things have happened since I've been sober. You know, there are also a lot of difficulties along the way. Research shows that addiction and mental illness can happen at the same time. It's also true that substances can mask what had previously been there, or even make it worse due to how the brain gets rewired from continued substance use. Finding treatment for two diagnoses can be important for folks sobering up. As far as good things go, though, Jason finds he still applies what he learned at GWEC at the body shop he works at. I definitely do um, refer to some of the tricks of the trade that I learned when I was building that canoe and apply it to repairs that I have to do on, on different kinds of boats at the marina. You know, the first time I experienced what it's like working with fiberglass and resin was out on the land. You know, I think it's kind of funny that the first constructive project of any kind that I took part in in my current sobriety was, was building a boat of some kind. More broadly, there are softer skills he takes with him too. You know, the trade that I'm learning right now is one that definitely demands a, a certain level of tenacity and patience. And those are two things I didn't have. You know, I, I couldn't see through something that was tedious and time consuming and learning how to be patient and tolerant and relaxed out in the wild has helped me to learn how to, uh, to kind of be that same way when I'm at work today. Me and Matthew were here in Toronto, and um, I would say that there's a lot of kind of like stigma about folks who are who are not sober on the street. What message do you have for people here to help them feel more compassion towards folks who are struggling? I do my best to not be too judgmental or critical or discriminate today. But there was a time when I was very judgmental and very critical. So I guess all I can say is that what I've learned is that when I'm approaching a person, place, thing, or situation from a place of judgment, I can't really be of much help. I, I understand that um, the person I once was can be seen as a, a great burden and a great weight for society to carry and a great problem that, you know, communities face on a daily basis. Like I said, if, if approaching from a place of judgment and criticism or, you know, ill feelings, you know, we, we can't really be of assistance or, or be of much service to those people or really any people, in my opinion. I'm curious, like, what do you do now these days for your mental health? 
aside from continuing to utilize the medicines like I was when I was out on the land, you know, such as smudging or, you know, picking up my eagle feather and preparing cedar tea or, you know, praying and meditating and getting in touch with the land. Something I think I've turned to more than anything else is exercise. Um, but on the other hand, I can also drink six cups of coffee and smoke a pack of cigarettes in a day. So. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope to leave it there with Jason discussing the way he copes to affirm that it's complicated to maintain good mental health. Throughout the show, mental health professionals have told us there is no one way to heal. There isn't a way to do it perfectly. And it is definitely not linear. Reporting out this episode on land-based healing, a common thread of the show really sunk in. The message was consistent. Whether it was from a medicine wheel, teachers saying that learning to cope is like a muscle, doctors highlighting the importance of the social determinants of health, a neuroscientist lauding how cutting-edge individualized medicine might be in the near future, or a psychologist exploring promising new digital options, the message was consistent. The toolbox is rightfully varied. There's no one answer because of the diversity of experiences that brings people to the headspace they're in. And a main barrier to good mental health is when we act like one answer is a panacea. Another barrier could be rigid adherence to criteria of what is considered successful treatment, or maybe the lack of clear criteria altogether. Making the show has been a real journey. And honestly, there was so much more I wish we could have discussed, but maybe another time. I hope the show was a helpful start that helped to shed light on a fraught topic and spur some imagination about how we think of mental health and approaches to care. I would love to hear what you thought of In Our Heads. You can write me at T-L-A-M, T-L-A-M, at tvo.org, or find me on Twitter at T-L-M-S-Y. If Twitter's not your thing, I'm on Instagram at T-L-S-Y. This episode tried to focus on a solution and a success story, albeit couched in the challenges that come with success. And so if you're feeling like you need help, you can always call Wellness Together Canada at 1-866-585-0445 or text wellness to 686868 for youth or 741-741 for adults. We'll also list more resources in our show notes. In Our Heads is hosted and written by me, Tiff Lamb, and co-produced with Matthew O'Mara. This episode featured additional reporting from TVO Today's Ontario Hubs journalist, Charnel Anderson. Matthew and I also reported and edited the show. The show also relies on reporting from Generation Distress, an investigative journalism bureau series published in the Toronto Star. The team was led by Robert Cribb, Declan Keogh, Julia Fioni, and Charlie Buckley. This episode had production support from Erica Giancola, Carla Lucetta, Nikki Ashworth, and Jonathan Hallowell. Shariyev Tajvidi is managing editor for podcasts and digital video. Lori Few is executive producer, digital. And John Ferry is VP of programming and content here at TVO. Thanks again for listening to In Our Heads. <laughs>